You know, in our country, people start at different starting lines. Some of us are very fortunate. Others of us come from very humble beginnings, like my family. You know, my family walked to this country. My parents walked to this country. We may not be able to control the poverty that kids come from, but the one thing we can control as a school system is eight to three, because we know that if we can get that right, the changes to that child and the opportunities that come to that child will really transform not only their own lives, but our country you know, as a whole. We've chosen as a foundation to take on some of the toughest problems in the world. And in education, there's no tougher problem than high school. For too long in education, we've been about marginal change. And now we're looking to how do we get more significant outcomes? But you have to take an honest look at both the courage and the action that the leaders in that place are willing to take and the really difficult obstacles that they're going to run up against. In New York City, there was a real problem around for high schools. And the problem was that not enough kids were graduating. When I started, the citywide four-year graduation rate was something like 48%. And when you disaggregated that by borough, the Bronx has a graduation rate roughly 30%. Close to 90% of the students say that they want to graduate from high school and go on to college. But if you were to look at their performance, their behavior, there would be nothing there that would say that these students have these aspirations. Kids were lost. You get 3,000 kids in the building, the principal here, and by the time he gets to know the kids, they've either dropped out or graduated. So it became a problem that the only one that the kids would talk to are the kids. I don't think I had one friend that had a passing grade in my first year, so it kind of made it hard to go to school when people are like, all right, we're going to cut today. And everybody around me is kind of, you know, just cutting and having fun. I I wanted to, you know, be part of that too, so. When we started talking about the high school problem, a number of our board members said, don't touch it. There's really nothing you can do. Uh, and stay focused on elementary, stay focused on middle if you're a little brave. But high schools were the place of last resort. New Visions is a private not-for-profit. We had created 32 small schools, the majority of which were elementary and middle schools. Michelle Cahill, who was at the Carnegie Corporation at the time, approached me and said, would you be interested in doing some work in high schools? At about the same time, Michelle reached out to the Open Society Institute and to the Gates Foundation. And we ultimately had three foundations with very different values, but which we were able to kind of weave together into a coherent strategy in New York. At the same moment, there was uh, a new mayor and a new chancellor. That was the initial key lever, that you had political leadership here in the city who had the courage to take public education reform on, to own it. The mayor ran on the issue of it's time to fix our schools, I need control, I need to be held accountable, it's the most important function in the city, and the mayor should be the one responsible for it. And then he appointed a chancellor who also was extremely committed because he comes out of a strong civil rights background to the equality of education for all children in New York City. The year before I got here, there was this $30 million invested by the Gates uh, Foundation along with Carnegie and uh, George Soros' foundation. And I remember I'd been on a job for maybe a week or so, and I went to one of those schools in the South Bronx that was opening that year. South Bronx was one of the schools where we were putting three small schools in ninth grades in the building and then slowly transitioning the larger school out. Joel came and saw it and saw the kids and then turned to me and said, so Bob, this is fantastic. Can you give me 150 more of them? Chancellor Klein made it his priority that high schools would be transformed and that large failing high schools would be phased out and replaced by academically rigorous small schools and these small schools would increase graduation rates and uh, college going rates for students. We see our investments in New York City um, as catalysts. Catalysts that hopefully help seed great ideas, give them a fertile place to grow, at which point the public can take the germination of those seeds and turn them into great policy and great practice for scale and sustainability. There were organizational changes. The chancellor uh, gave school principals far more autonomy in response for uh, greater accountability for outcomes. The challenges of building a school on this campus 
were immense. It was not a safe place. It was not a place defined by a student success in any sense of the word. There was, frankly, more of a police presence than an instructional presence. It was tough primarily in convincing students and their families that we were legit. His relationship with the students and his relationship with his faculty is very evident. Like You see that he's not just the head of the school, and he really is our biggest cheerleader. Before you can change the student experience, you have to change the adult experience. I like how you said a wave of ideas washed into my head. That was very descriptive. What is different here than any of the other schools that I've been in is that there's really this idea of shared ownership of the school, empowering the teachers and even empowering the students, and always striving towards doing what we do better. They don't expect one thing from the students who get good grades and then another thing from the students who don't get good grades. They have one common expectation of getting into college and staying in college and that's for everybody and not just the good performing kids. We are a public school here open to all comers. We get students from Brooklyn, we get students from across the street. They walk in here and we expect them to be college material in four years. That is our mission. Then there are the naysayers, uh, the people who say that what you're trying to do, educate these kids for college, is going to result in failure, that these students are not college material. So there's this pressure on the intermediaries to make sure that our students are performing and we're making good on the promise. Our investments were to help fund the startup of these new small high schools. What I think all of us under anticipated was how that would have a ripple effect throughout the entire system. It was a, a tremendous growing pain for New York City public education. It was a growing pain, I think, for the foundation. Some kids get deflected so that other schools are ending up taking even more challenging kids. Some of that was inevitable, some of that was execution or, or the lack thereof on our part. This is tough stuff. If you do bold stuff, you're going to make mistakes. If you don't want to make mistakes, get out of this business because you're going to make them or just protect the status quo and, you know, pretend. One of the big stumbling blocks in, in New York City was the failure to really embrace the community and to inform the community and to share the thinking. The reality is, is that you got to set everybody on fire with this. You have to get everybody fired up and clear which doesn't mean that everyone's going to agree with you all the time. We have to get comfortable with debate. If you go it alone, you can go fast. If, you, if we go together, we can go far. And I think as we think about transplanting the lessons from New York City to places like Washington, D.C. or elsewhere, we're well advised to take that into consideration. People did not think you could take high schools that had that low graduation rate and get to anywhere near 70, 80, 90 percent graduation rates. And what I love about it is we didn't have big parent engagement programs. We didn't have a poverty eradication program. This was you do something in the school and you can change kids' lives. My daughter, tremendous, tremendous turnaround. Instead of her being just passing, a student just passing, which, which is a CD student, she's an A student. All her grades, tremendous. She loves coming to school. My grades were poor in my old school. And here, my classes, I get 80s, sometimes 90s if I really focus. I've achieved a lot in two years with my life. I feel like I'm a whole different person now. South Brooklyn Community High School also provides young people with paid internships that might pique their interest and, and desire to go on to college or a technical school or a training school. In the internship program, I worked nine hours and I spent one hour a week with my peers talking about their experiences with their jobs. You learn a lot from working. You're accomplishing so much, you're like, all right, I'm getting this done. I've just advanced to this level. You're gonna probably say to yourself, maybe I should apply that to school. I'm going to college. I'm attending New York City Tech. 
I'm majoring in electrical engineering. But right now, I kind of treat everything like a job. Now, with a critical mass of small schools, there is evidence that this is making a difference for students here. Just the fact that we open over 200 new small schools is so powerful. Most school districts in America don't have 200 schools. We're outperforming other large cities significantly, but I want to be realistic. We're nowhere remotely where we need to be. We're taking kids who would have dropped out, we're getting them to a diploma, and hopefully we're enabling them to go on to lead productive lives. But the reality is, in the 21st century, kids need a lot more. We used to think it was a luxury to go to college or post-secondary. Now you really can't be a viable wage earner or support your family or do the things that you want to do in terms of quality of life without having some kind of post-secondary education. The major challenge in getting schools to produce kids who succeed in college is really academic rigor. And we have to figure out ways to end the silence around what happens in classrooms and really talk about what good instruction looks like. Small schools have taught us so much about personalized learning, taught us a great deal about the kind of student supports that are necessary to help kids stay on track and um, graduate successfully. We've also learned that there are other ingredients that are hugely important. We've learned that teaching and learning is a primary factor in everybody's success, no matter what geography they're sitting in. And if we don't hit that bottom line, which is outcomes for kids, we won't have done what we set out to do. I think it's hard to invest in something that you don't know is something for sure, so you don't know what the outcome is going to be. But it's like you look at what we've done and look at all the seniors that are coming out of Bronx Lab, going to these great colleges, and I don't know if we all would have been going to these great colleges if we would have went to a big high school. So have hope in the little things that are coming out good and then have hope in the things that can be improved.